let's get to the pastor who became a Muslim. So let me get you the clip and play it. It's like about four minutes. We're going to play the clip. Here is a pastor. Now, everyone's a pastor. It turns out he's a he was a campus pastor. But see, that means pastor. And why he became a Muslim. Now, Eddie keeps trying to fish him to say certain things, and he's not biting the line. And he asks him, why did you leave Islam and become a Muslim? So here it is, the Dean Show TV. Here it is. Here's a clip. You got a former pastor here. So you were actually trying to convert Muslims at one time. Yes, sir. Now you're listening to us here, listening to the Dean Show. You were watching the Dean Show before? Oh, also? man, since 2007 or 2008. Since 2007. Yes, sir. Yeah, tell us a little about that. Well, I was doing campus ministry at Penn State. I was a campus pastor at Penn State. So that's where I met a lot of people from other international students. A lot of them were practicing Muslims. So at that point, uh, you know, I was trying to share my faith in Christ. We always came across Trinitarian issues, things like that. But I remember it was an atheist that actually said to me years ago, well, where in, I was saying to them that Jesus was God at the time. They said, well, where is that a requirement in the Bible to obtain salvation? What if you don't believe that Jesus is God? Do you go to hell? And I could not find the answer in the Bible ever since. And I can never get a satisfactory answer. That's always in the back of my mind. But the deity of Christ was never a salvation issue to begin with. But Jesus never claims to be God anyway, in actuality, when you're honest about what the scriptures have to say. So the process of turning to Islam has been quite a process. It's not an overnight thing. No. And the key to it as a Christian is to read the Bible not as one book, but as 66 separate books with different intentions by the authors. And when you see that, it becomes very clear what the truth is. So my concern is more the theology. And so when you see the words of Christ compared to Paul, I like to say to Christians today, they follow Pollyanity, not really Christianity. Because what Jesus teaches is actually a different message than Paul. Paul says that he, he curses two people by name. Jesus says to forgive people. And he says on the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. But like I said, the Apostle Paul, he curses people. Jesus says that not one jot or diddle, diddle will, remain, will go away from the law. But the Apostle Paul, he's against the eating restrictions. And he says the one who follows the Torah is accursed. Even though Psalms 19 says that God reveals his, his life through the Torah. And all of Psalms 119 says that the Torah, the law, gives you life. So how can someone who is a believing Jew, Paul, say that he's against the Torah and you're cursed for that? And Jesus agrees with the Old Testament. And if you find Muhammad, you will find Jesus anyway. Because Muhammad leads you to Jesus. And Jesus does give life, yes. But Muhammad, it's the, it's the message. They point to Allah. They point to one God. Jesus says, worship Allah, worship God. Muhammad says the same. Abraham says the same. I just want to share that. Just separate Paul from Jesus and the truth to become clear. Like the Shema says, Shema Yisrael et Ahad, God is one. And so that's what Islam teaches, Tawheed, that God is one. And I feel like I got born again when I finally realized that God is one. That's it. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. There's nothing worthy of worship except the creator of the heavens are Allah. Simple. That's what you have to do. Simple. Just worship on God and be obedient. Do your best. Just do your best to be obedient and worship on God. And give him thanks because that's thank faith. You, thank you so thank much. Thank you, sir. Here with former pastor, say your name again? Brad. It's former pastor Brad here on the Dean Show. We look forward to having you back for a real episode. God willing, inshallah. Thank inshallah. Sir, thank you, sir. Here, bro. Yeah. You probably know me. Yeah, Anyways, I know. Where are you from? Uh, I was on another video. Man, dude. Yeah, you are. Were you with me on a video? Because you look like I've seen you also on YouTube. Yeah, I've been on YouTube. So let's keep that that for now. But yeah, I'm, I just came out of work, just so you know. Okay, so okay. I'm in my work van and stuff, you know. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in a nice setting. Listen, I'm just here to learn from you. I'm not here to debate. I respect yeah. you very highly. It's okay. I really like you, okay? Yeah, I don't mind. If someone has objections who's sincere and not here to attack me, I don't mind, brother. But yeah, I I'm not here for personal attacks. I'm just, I just want to learn. Listen, like, Hi, bro. I have a couple of questions. I, I, I'd like to see what you have to say. All right. So, like, right. Matthew, I think it's 410. You know, I actually have a Bible on me here. Oh, and that's why I know you. You're the guy that became the Muslim. I watch your testimony. Yeah. I know, I know you, man. I actually reached out to you, man. Oh, you did? Okay, yeah. Yeah, we yeah, talked about comment section. That's why you look familiar. I did a response to you. You're the guy. Yep. <laughs> man, dude, it's good to have you, man. I really, I, I, I really appreciate that. And I'm, I'm, thank you for allowing me. I, I, I feel honored to talk to you. I really do. I just want you to know that. Yeah, yeah, no, don't worry, man. I'm not, I'm not all that. But yeah, you're the gentleman. Was it on the Dean show? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, no, I met Eddie. Eddie's yeah, that was a nice a couple months ago. Yeah, that's going back in September. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, guys, if you don't know who this gentleman is, he's the gentleman that I provided a very direct critique. He was the campus pastor. Yeah, but you know, you were right. It's kind of weird how you said that because I got my dates a little wrong. I said 2000, 2008, but in actuality, it was like 2005. And at that point, I was actually a Christian just for three years. So you were spot on about that. I didn't, I was in catechumenous eyes, or how you say, I'd have a catechism, you can say. So yeah. I was just really brand new. But what, yes. what people were amazed with was that I was so on fire, I was leading a lot of people to Christ and stuff, and that was it. <laughs> well, I will, I'll answer all your questions, but after I'm done, I want to know, and I'm not putting you on the spot, I want to answer your questions about Christianity, but I think you jumped the gun in becoming Muslim. You don't know Islam that well, and you fell for the party line, because if I were to ask you, because you, you are now embracing Salafi Islam, because Eddie is a Salafi, Sunni, you believe things about Islam that's going to confuse you. You may not know it yet, but I've done the research. But ask me a question about Matthew 4.10. Let me give you the context. Satan's telling Jesus to worship him, and he says, Depart from me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Yes, that's exactly it. You know, and okay. just so you know, I do take notes and stuff in my Bible. You know what I mean? So, like, every, I really read my Bible a lot. I want you people to know that. So, I have torn pages here. So, sure. I'm really intense on my studies. And I take notes. Yeah. Different colors mean different things. So I don't take the Bible casually. I do take it very seriously. Well, I, so, I know you do. Like, you have a zeal, but may God bring you back. But anyway, yes, let's take yes, it sir. by step. What's the question? So like, like it says, like Jesus says, you know, worship the Lord your God. You know, Yahweh, your Elohim. So yeah. like, how, why does he not say like worship himself? Okay. Well, because in that context, Satan is tempting him to disobey the Father. So in that context, and if you study the scripture... He's saying, no, that he's come to the, to the earth to serve the Father and worship him. But since you quote Matthew, don't quote it selectively, because that same word, proskaneo, worship, yes. I want you to go to Matthew 14, 33. 14, okay, just like you wouldn't want me to take snippets of the Quran out of context, but read it in context. So the same Matthew that had Jesus saying to Satan, it says, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Because Jesus is on earth as a man to serve the Father, to become a servant. And I'll establish that for Matthew. You know, just we can't just I, I take... love that passage. I'm there, 1433. Okay, so what did they do to Jesus? Uh, same thing, they worshiped him. So if Jesus meant that you are to worship the Father alone to the exclusion of the Son, meaning that you cannot worship the Son, then when the disciples worship Jesus in the context of walking on water, in fact, if you go to Matthew 14, 27, when it says, do not be afraid, it is I. Actually, in the Greek, if you look at the Greek, it's ego, I me, I am. I am, that's right. Okay, but what's interesting, if you know your Old Testament background, yes, sir. one of the functions of God is that he tramples over the waves and the seas to demonstrate his sovereignty over creation. Right, and, and he controls the water. Say it again, yes. And throughout the book of Isaiah, one of the names of God is Anihu, which in Greek is ego, I me. This is why even liberal scholars or not Christian will tell you this is a theophany where Jesus is unveiling his identity as Yahweh in the flesh because he says, I am, do not be afraid, in Echo of Isaiah 43. And he's trampling over the seas, demonstrating his power over the seas, that he has the ability to authorize you to trample the seas as well. Okay. Now, do you agree, by the way, because you said that when you read the Bible, led you to Islam, will Islam allow you to worship Jesus as God's son and call Allah your father? No, because you don't say Bismi Isa, you say Bismi Allah. And you can know you I mean? say Allah is my father? Can I say, well, no, they don't call him father in the Quran. So the very verses that you read that supposedly led you to Islam shows that you should have never been a Muslim because Jesus is saying that that God that he came to serve is his father and Jesus is the son. So I'm still wondering, how did that lead you to Islam when Allah is not the father of anyone, Jesus is not his son? Well, I, I'm just more like not like, like trying to seek it by titles. I was just a man trying to seek truth. You know what I mean? And that's kind of how I was seeing it. I, I'm yeah, not really worried talk, about right? What I'm saying is, because in your testimony, you said, forget Paul, even though the Islam confirms Paul, which they didn't tell you, but that's okay. We'll get there. You said, just study Jesus and you'll worship the God of Muhammad because Muhammad brings you to Jesus. That's what you said. So I want to know how, in the uh, for the life of me, you read Matthew 4, where the point of the temptation is to show if Jesus is truly God's son, who's in perfect obedience to the Father, and the same Matthew has Jesus being worshipped as God's son, all of which the Quran contradicts. So how can that bring me to Muhammad? Well, it's just kind of like, I, I was thinking that Paul is like a development. 
and a different kind of Christianity, like in the historical level. You know, yeah, well, so forget like, Paul right now. I'm going by what you said, the Gospels. Yeah, just I the just four read, Gospels. And I, and I got more verses. I'm not trying to change the subject. I just yeah. read two statements where Jesus says that the God that he serves is the Father, and he's the Son, and as the Son, he's worshipped, none of which the Quran agrees with, and yet you exhorted people in your video. Just read Jesus, and you're going to see that the God of Jesus and Muhammad, same God, Imam brings you Jesus. No, it doesn't. It actually brings me further away from Muhammad because Muhammad said, Allah is not the Father, Jesus is not the Son. So how can I take what you said and that result in me becoming a Muslim? You know, I'm going to be straight up with you, okay, Sam? You gave a very good argument with that passage. I don't know what to say to her right now. Okay, I'm good. That's pressured. fine. I'm not pressuring you. You don't need to. Let me give you another one where Jesus yeah. works it. Go to Matthew 21, 15 and 16. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done, and the children who were shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became indignant and said to him, Do you not hear what these children are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you, not, have you never read? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you've prepared praise for yourself. Okay, now... Notice what Jesus said to justify the children praising him. Do you see what he did? Because they're angry. Do you see the children are praising you, saying, Hosanna to the son of David? Yep. Right? They're indignant. So what did Jesus say? Yes. Have you not read what is written? And he quotes Psalm 8, verse 2. Yes. Now, you know what the problem with that is? What's that? Psalm 8, verse 1 to 2 is about children praising Jehovah. Why would Jesus quote Psalm 8 to justify children praising him if he's not Jehovah in the flesh? Okay, that's fair. Yeah, I see your point. I really so do. Now, again, let me ask you, I'm not going in Islam. How could this statement lead me to Muhammad when Jesus said, children praising me is something that should be expected because when children on the presence of Jehovah, they cannot help but praise him. And he quotes Psalm 8 to show, I am that Jehovah God that the children praise when they're in my presence. So Jesus just claimed that he's Jehovah who deserves the worship of Jehovah. Very good. I, I'm, I'll concede because okay. like these weren't the passages I was looking at. Let me be straight up. I was not I'm, looking at these particular passages. I know you were. not I'm not attacking you. Now I want you to go, to Matthew, not. Yeah. go to Matthew 1 and let me know if you have another question because I want to walk you through Matthew how when you said this would make Muslim, I chuckled. No, it won't. It'll actually lead you away from Muhammad because Muhammad did not preach the same Jesus or the same God, but that's okay. In Matthew okay. 1, 21, now, whether you believe it's inspired or not, remember, I'm going by your exhortation. You told Christians to read Jesus, forget Paul. Well, the where, where I'm going to read Jesus is in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In Matthew, the angel tells Joseph, you are to give him the name Jesus because for he shall save his people from their sins. And that's See what that? the name Yeshua means. Yeshua means God's salvation. Okay, but now you're confusing me, though. It's not God who's saving, meaning the Father. Jesus will save his people from their sins. Read why he's called Jesus. And he, the child, will save his people from their sins. So why is he doing what the Old Testament is only God can do? Psalm 130, verse 8. Jehovah redeems his people. But the child is called God is salvation because the child will save his people from their sins. Now, I'd like to see any prophet in the Old Testament, even the Quran, that saves anyone from their sins. Fair. Now, can I say this in response to this, though? Yes. Like, just so you know my perspective, I'm not countering the argument here. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. But, like, I was kind of just talking about the red letters of Jesus. Now, you just okay. proved me wrong in the previous verse. You rocked that. I'll give that to you. You just gave me a red letter thing. But what I, how I was seeing it is, like, in the Gospels, it's like the commentary a lot of times is what will try to exalt Jesus. But in Jesus' actual words, like, for example, the prodigal son, he's forgiven, no sacrifice required. In the problem with that, the, you didn't read the prodigal son correctly because in the context, who's the one coming seeking to save who's lost? Jesus. In the parable, if you've read it carefully, he gives three parables. In the parables, it's describing Jesus because they're complaining, why does he sit with tax collectors and sinners? Right. And Jesus gives three parables to show because I came to save that which is lost. Oh, and that snap. Means, uh, so the father in that passage you're saying is really Jesus. Just like the woman who found the lost coin is who? It, it's, um, it's Jesus. Was the, the, the and the super, shepherd, and the shepherd who finds the lost sheep is who? That'd be Christ. 
that, that's to confirm the Luke 19.10, where Jesus' red letter says in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost. So how does that prove Islam again? All right, let me look at Luke 19.10. Yeah. Uh, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So but how will do you, any prophet do that though? That's what I'm saying. Like the prophet's you know, supposed to bring you repentance. The prophets themselves needed to be saved from their sin and wrath of God, but Jesus is the one who's saving you from your sin and wrath. You know what? You're right. Because if you read verse nine, he says, "Salvation has come to this house, for he's a son of Abraham." But who brought that salvation? I, the Son of Man, came to bring salvation. Yeah, because you know when I, I read the Quran like twelve or thirteen times, you know what I mean. And like I listen to it, I even know some Arabic. I'm learning to read Arabic. I can read it. But the thing is, there's like Jesus is so exalted in the Quran. Is he? He's highly exalted, and, and so, it only mentions Muhammad like four times. Yes, and that's so, true. And so like it's just it's it's really interesting. I always kind of seeing it was like historically because there were Christian Jews that were like Unitarian, like the James people. James and Jew don't call Jesus God. You want to bet they do? I don't want to bet. Go to, go to James one one. Go to James Maybe some push ups. No, no, I'm going to show you that they do because I'd like that. Okay, can you show me, please? Yeah, because now we're going off the red letter edition. That's fine. Go to James one one. Okay, because I I like James a lot. He's a brother of Jesus. You know. Yes. Let me show you what he says because remember, Islamically speaking, you only have one Rub in heaven, Rub Lord in heaven, right? Yeah. And that's Allah. That's not Jesus, right? That's right. And you can't be a servant of anyone other than Allah, correct? That's right. And I do see slave also in the Bible through the word doulos in the Greek. Yes. So well, I have no problem being a slave. But the, the reason why Americans don't translate it as servant and not slave is because of the Civil War. After the Civil War, it became politically incorrect to translate doulos as slave. So they started translating it as servant to soften it. But it weakens the gospel because we're, we're supposed to be slaves of Yahweh, right? Yep. So that's how well, apostles. No, you said slaves of Yahweh, right? Can I be a slave of someone other than Yahweh in heaven? In other words, in heaven, I'm only the slave of Yahweh, right? I can't be the slave of Yahweh and someone else in heaven, right? Yeah. But then you just prove James is either a, he's a kafir, because read how he begins his epistle, James 1.1. 1, 1. All right, I will. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus. Oh, man. Where's Jesus? <laughs> he's in heaven. So how could he call Jesus Rab, Lord, and say I'm his slave too? Right. That's like calling him Yahweh. Right. Thank you. So you got it, right? What about James 2.1, though? Okay. James 2.1. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Now, so does he called... Go ahead. Does Kairos necessarily, like Lord Kairos, does that necessarily mean God? No, but you didn't hear the argument. It wasn't meaning God. Jesus is in heaven. Can a monotheist have any other Lord in heaven besides the true God? No. So, but Jesus is in heaven. He's calling him Lord, glorious Lord, and I'm his slave. How if he's a Muslim? That's true. So just let me just read it again. Yeah. And by the way, the Greek is literal. Lord Jesus Christ, the glory. I know. I see that. So can you explain to me if James is a Muslim, preached Islam, why is he saying that Jesus in heaven, he is Lord, he is the glory, and I'm his slave? I think what seals it for your argument is the word glory. I would Even say if he have glory. Just Islamically, Rabb, Rabbul Alameen, Rabb, Lord of the worlds. Of the you world, cannot so. call anyone other than Allah Lord, especially in heaven. This is Tawheed al rububiyyah So why is James calling Jesus Rabb? And he's calling him Lord while he's in heaven and saying, on earth, I'm his Abd, Abdul Yesuh, slave of Jesus. When Islam, that's shirk. Okay. You went to Jude, right? Say what? Yeah. You, you, okay, so I'm going to go. Now let's go to Jude, though. Let's see what Jude says. Now Jude I like a lot because that demands obedience. Well, you're going to see what he says about Jesus. It's not going to be that helpful to Islam. Go to Jude chapter 1, read verse 1 first. It's that same thing you said. So it says Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. And Jesus is not on earth, right? No. But now read verse 4, though. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. 
How can he be a Muslim when he says, Jesus is your only Lord and Master in heaven? Fair. You know what? Oh, but verse 5 is going to be a little harder for you, brother. Read verse okay. 5. <laughs> that would desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. You know how to read in context and you know how to identify the nearest antecedent of the word Lord. In the context, who's the Lord that he just mentioned? Well, that'd be Yahweh. Well, read it again because in the context, remember we read context. Right, I know. Because I got to look at the previous verse. So the Lord Jesus because, Christ. Now because, I because, desire you. Ah, because he said he's the only Lord. So if he's the only Lord, then who's the Lord that he's mentioning in verse 5? So he's saying like the... The fire in the, in the cloud was Jesus, basically. Oh, oh, yeah. And he agrees with Paul. And let me give you further proof of that. Did you know that the oldest Greek copies of Jude have the word Jesus instead of Lord in verse 5? That's why if you have a footnote in your NSB, if you have a note, I don't know if you do. Yeah, but I, do. I see a C next to Lord. Oh, man, I need my glasses. <laughs> it should tell you that or Jesus because the earliest copies of Jude read Jesus. In fact, you know what the... Earliest copy says, and I have the documentation. I'll give it to you. Yeah, I see that. It says two early manuscripts read Jesus. That's what it says. Okay. Yep. And then only that. Did you know the oldest copy of Jude, right? The oldest copy is P72. It actually reads God Christ, Theos Christos, the God Christ delivered them and punished them. So all the copies and the variant readings that arose because scribes make mistakes, and that's the same with the Quran show you that the context is calling Jesus that Lord, that God who was there during the time of Moses. They never call him, um, they never call like Theos. You don't see like Lord Theos that I know of in the Greek. I, yeah. If it's ever like that, it's always with Jesus after that. You know, yeah. so it'd be like Lord Theos Christos. But it's yeah. always like, but whenever Lord is mentioned, it's always mentioned in, in, with Jesus, I notice a lot of times. Yeah, because in the New Testament, when you say in the Old Testament, Lord God, you're saying Jehovah God. But now yeah. in the New Testament, it's trying to fill out the identity of Jehovah and that it's telling you Jehovah has now become flesh. So it's now Jehovah, Jesus Christ. And that's proven from the very Gospels where it announces John as the voice of Isaiah who prepares people for the coming of Jehovah. Right? Yes. But who was the person that John prepared for? Oh, it was Jesus. But according to the prophecy, John was to prepare for Jehovah. Right, for Yahweh, right. But you just said he prepared for Jesus, and then who's Jesus? Okay, I see a point. Yeah, you're saying he's, he's, he's Yahweh. No, Jesus. according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they say John the Baptist is the voice of Isaiah 40, who prepares the way for Jehovah. Then John says, I come to prepare for Jesus. Ipso facto, Jesus is that Jehovah who became flesh that John announced. Right, because he's referencing to the Old Testament. Now, let me ask you this, okay? Okay. Let's say, like, you know, like, was Christianity, like, um, you know, like, is it is it kind of just like they kind of misunderstood the Messiah? Everyone misunderstood the Messiah back then and even now, because if you know your history, which you seem to do, the Jews were all confused. Are there two Messiahs? For example, the Dead Sea Scrolls, they believed there would be a Messiah who would be from the line of Aaron and a Messiah from the house of David and a prophet. Then you go to the Jews who asked John in John 1. They're expecting the Christ, the prophet, and Elijah. Then in the rabbinic Judaism, in the Talmud, they're expecting two messiahs. Messiah, son of Joseph, and Messiah, son of David. So there was confusion back then. There's confusion even now because the Old Testament's written such a way you can misunderstand it. Just like Christians misunderstand the exact nature of Jesus' return. Just like Muslims misunderstand how Isa will come. That's just something common to all of us. Well, yeah, because in Al uh, I think it's Almedia. I think it might be I I A. It might be off in the reference. It talks about Jesus dying in the Arabic. Yeah, it does. So, but now if you ask your friend Eddie, he'll say no. He was neither killed nor crucified, but it appeared unto him because someone was caused to look like Jesus, and he replaced Jesus. And the most popular opinion is Judas. Now, you don't buy that, do you? Now, I want to ask you this. Okay, when I first read the Quran years ago, years ago, right? I'm like 19. Okay, before 9-11. And I remember reading Surah 4, 157 and thinking, wow, this sounds pretty biblical. It just sounds like the Jews just didn't crucify Jesus. Mm -hmm. The Romans did. In the next verse, it talks about his ascension. Yep, I agree. I agree so, that's what it means. And then if he dies, Almadia, 
You know, yeah, what I mean? five verse one seventeen. It says, "When you cause me to die." It comes from the verb to wafa. The problem is, the Muslims that you're dealing with, the Salafis, they'll say, "No, that's not what it means." So you can't interpret the Quran on your own unless you want to be a Quran only Muslim. So what do you want to be? A Sunni, a Shia, or Quran only Muslim? And if you want to be Sunni, you want to be Salafi or Ashari. They don't even agree because Eddie, the one you talk, and ask him when you meet him because he's going to interview you. Say, do you believe that Allah has literally two right hands? He has a face, he has eyes, and a shin, and a foot, and these are literal characteristics unlike anything creation? Yeah, they believe Allah has a body. Do you believe that about God? Well, I kind of do, because it says in Genesis 1 that we're created in God's image. Think more deeply about that, because it says male and female. So if God has a body, does he have female and male genitalia? Well, check this out. The word um, spirit, ruha, is a yeah, feminine well. word. Ruha is sure. feminine. So maybe but God can't say Greek, male and female through that. No, because you're butchering the language. I'll tell you why. Because in Greek, pneuma is neuter. It's it. You're right. In the Greek it is, but the Hebrew original, it's still feminine. But that's the point. Nouns may have gender without applying their gender. Because if you play that, if you go that route, okay. you have in, in, in Hebrew, the word wisdom is hokmah. It's feminine. That's why in Proverbs, wisdom is feminized. It's, it's personified as a woman. Because that's how language works. You're right. I'll hand you that because as a man, you still want to be a Proverbs 31 man. If yeah. you're trying to get a woman like that and you're not like that, she's out of your league. Exactly. Not only that, even the word Ecclesiastes, koholeth, the word is feminine. It means female teacher, but the writer is a male teacher. <laughs> so okay. you can't argue. You can't argue on the basis of gender, meaning the noun because it's female or masculine or feminine. Because if that's the case, then you're going to have gender confusion. Because if you go to Hebrew, it's feminine. In Greek, it's neuter. Nouns in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Arabic are either feminine or masculine. Now, Greek has a neuter. But no one argues. For example, if we go with that logic, Allah is described as a he and a him, never a she or a her. And therefore, is Allah male? Well, we just kind of assume. I don't think any Muslim would want us. They would tell you. Again, I'm just telling you what they're going to tell you. No, no, Allah transcends gender. He's unlike anything creation. So you can't make up Islam as you go along because then you're going to be ousted. If you're going to a Salafi Sunni mosque, they're going to expect you to toe the party line and believe what they believe. So even though it's, so it's say you do believe Allah has a body, but body requires shape and dimension and space and place, right? But what, why would that be an issue? Like if we're made in God's image, maybe he has a head. Maybe he has hands to make a hand for yeah, us. Okay, well, then that means you don't believe Allah created everything. Because that's why I want you to reason. Because if you have a body, a body requires space. So if that body is uncreated, that means Allah has always existed in space and place. That means there are certain aspects of space and place he didn't create and he's bound to. Is that what you believe? Well, no, but I don't know if that implies that. That's why I'm getting a little lost. Well, hold on. But How can you have a body? You're saying body, right? Yes, sir. Without having space for that body to be contained in. So where does that body? I see what you're trying to say. I see your argument. Okay. So that so unless you don't believe God created all things, that's fine. But if you believe God created all things, all time, space, and place, then he is before time, space, and place. Then by his very nature, he has to be bodiless. That He can assume a body. He can appear in a body. But that's not what the Salafis are saying. He has his They won't use the term body, but they'll say no. These are his characteristics, and then they'll say, Allahu alam, bila kaifa, we don't know how. So they'll appeal to mystery when they can't explain what they believe. But when we Christians appeal to mystery, ah, see? But wouldn't that be like pantheism, though? Like God's everywhere. No, because what does it mean that God is everywhere? You have to define your terms. When you say God is everywhere, you mean that God <clears throat> oversees every part of creation because it's under his control. There is no part of creation that's outside of his control. So it doesn't mean he has to be in creation, because then that would again assume that God is tangible and material. And I'm telling you, he's not. But God sustains creation, gives light to creation. And that's what it means he's everywhere. Meaning wherever there's creation, he's sustaining it. He's controlling it. He's overseeing it. But he doesn't have to be in creation or a part of creation to do that. Can I ask you a sincere question, though, based on what you're saying, though? Yes. Okay, so you're saying Jesus is God. Second coming, he's riding on a white horse. Yes. He has a body. So if you're going to say in his spiritual glorified body, so it's summa, summa numa in Greek. So do you so believe that he has a body? Yeah, I believe he ascended. Jesus. Okay, so if you understood Christianity, because you said you're only three years, spiritual body does not mean a body that's not physical, tangible. 
If you reread Paul, because you went to Paul now, the very Paul that you told me to avoid. So you want me to go to Paul? Because it's no, no, Paul. It's in Revelation. No, it doesn't say soma body in Revelation. You said oh, soma. Oh, you're right. Body. It does in First Corinthians 15. Right. So, so you want me to go to Paul or you want me to ignore Paul? We can go to it. Okay. If you read Paul, he he distinguishes two types of body: a suke and a pneuma. Suke body and a pneuma. Suke means psyche, soul, a soulish body from a spiritual body. If you read him carefully, by soulish body, he means a body under the control and influence of sin and corruption, which he calls flesh and blood. Because so if you study Paul's theology, by flesh, he means sinful, corrupt flesh, unless the context suggests otherwise. So he's saying the body you have now is suke. It's soulish under the power of sin and corruption. But when that age comes, this body will be transformed to be under the power and dominion of the spirit where it will no longer <clears throat> sin and you'll no longer disobey and you'll no longer decay. A spiritual body is a body under the dominion of the spirit. It's not a body that's not tangible. That's not how he uses the word spirit. He uses it in Galatians 6.1. He's talking to Christians who are in flesh bodies. He goes, you who are spiritual, help those who are weak. Well, does he mean they don't have flesh bodies? No, of course not. So spiritual body means a body under the power, dominion of the Holy Spirit, as opposed to being under your soulish influence, your fleshly carnal desires. Read them. That's what he says. Can so if Christ is man, and he rose as a man, and he stopped being a man, why would it surprise you that he has a physical body? Okay. But that would be still God. So God has a body then. Jesus no. had his shin. No, we don't confuse the divine with the human nature because Jesus as God, being spirit, transcends all creation, even his own body. He's in control of his body. Even though he has a body, he's not limited to it because as God, he's the one sustaining his body with the Father and the Spirit because we believe Father, Son, Spirit work together, not separately. So if the Son is giving you life, the Father is giving you life, the Spirit is giving you life, and that's Jesus himself saying that in John. In John 2, 19 and 22, who did Jesus say would raise his body once it's destroyed? Um, the, um, I don't know. What he is says, that? destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. I will raise it up. So now, how could Jesus raise up his body if he's not God who has control over life and death? Okay. But let me ask you this, though. Zechariah 12.10, right? Yahweh is talking. yod heh vav -Hey. me Whom they have pierced and mourn from him. Yes, what about it? How do you know that's not symbolic? Well, I mean, because Zechariah 13, 7, you find the verb. It says, he commands the sword. He goes, awake a sword against the shepherd, my fellow, the man who's my fellow, and strike him. And then the sheep will be scattered. So if I read Zechariah 12, 10 in context with Zechariah 13, 7, that Yahweh is a man. Okay. I never looked at uh, Zechariah 13, 7. Because you got to tie in Zechariah 12, 10 with Zechariah 13, 7. So I know that it's not metaphorical because the same Zechariah goes on to tell me the one who will be struck down, pierced through, is Jehovah's fellow who's called a man. Gaver, meaning man, who's his companion. I see that. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man, my associate, declares the Lord Elohim of hosts. And now here's the problem, though. The word associate, go look at the Hebrew. It's amit. It means your equal, one who has the same genus you do because you're related by kin, your next of kin. So he says, my associate, emmeth, the word emmeth, whatever it's used in the Old Testament, means next of kin. Some are related to you by genus, meaning you have the same nature. So who is this man that's related to God by nature? Well, yeah. Oh, man. And you know yeah. who quotes that about himself? His shepherd is here in this context, yeah. Yeah, but you know who quotes that about himself? Jesus does. Jesus. Mark 14, 27. 14. Yep. So Jesus just said, I am the man who is next of kin of Jehovah, who will be stuck down by the sword, and therefore, Zechariah 12, 10, that Jehovah who will be pierced is a man, and as a man he's pierced physically, but then he'll return, and then the Jews will recognize, this is the man whom we rejected, who happens to be our God in the flesh, and we didn't recognize him. And that's confirmed in Revelation 1, 7. What does okay. Revelation 1, 7 say? Let me look, look at it. Well, you read it, yeah. Oh, no, no, you can. It's okay. Yeah, it's, I don't want to slow your program down. Look, because behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth shall mourn because of it. 
That's quoting Zechariah 12, verse 10 to 14. It is. Yeah, I see it right here. See, there was a lot you did not know about the scripture, so you hastily rushed out of Christianity, which I'm not attacking you, but you should have been more patient on learning the Bible thoroughly and the biblical basis for these doctrines. Well, let me ask you this, okay? Okay, like the New Covenant, Jeremiah yes. 31, 31 through 30, you know, 34. Yes. You know, Hebrews quotes from it as well, I believe, in Hebrews chapter 10. Yep, the quotes in also Hebrews 8. So, like, one, a couple of issues I have with it is, like, well, one of the main one. the main one is that no longer will anyone teach his neighbor to know the Lord. Yes. Well, how is that even fulfilled in nowadays? How we how is Jesus the fulfillment of the new covenant? Yeah, because, again, this is why I said it would have been nice if someone had catechized you. Because the New Testament, it teaches the already not yet, meaning the prophecy has begun to be fulfilled. But its ultimate fulfillment awaits his return. But, like, when I read Jeremiah, though, it sounds like that's still future. Because it's really about how it the Jews are going to return and... It's fulfilled. Yeah, it we're saying we're in the new covenant now. You no, know, because it is future from the perspective of Jeremiah. It didn't happen. But then if you read on, Jesus begins it, inaugurates it, but will complete it when he returns. Because even the book of Zechariah, you quoted, how could it, how could it not have what we call a process of fulfillment when Zechariah tells you that only a remnant of the Jews will, be, will survive when the Lord comes to fight for them on that day, that means Jeremiah, Zechariah, if you take them into consideration with one another, there's going to be a stage in which this will be fulfilled, but the fulfillment is not overnight. Otherwise, you're going to have to assume that that covenant is only fulfilled when Jehovah comes down after they pierce them, and then he'll fully inaugurate the new covenant. How does that work? Well, like my issue with that, though, is like the Abrahamic covenant was instant based on God's promise. No, and then. No, it took 400 years because part of the covenant was that your descendants will inherit the land. And they didn't inherit it until 400 years later. That was part of the covenant. Okay. okay. So how okay. was it instant? Okay, you're right. Okay. Okay. Right? Didn't he say yeah. in Genesis 15, the four generation, 400 years from now? So no, it wasn't fulfilled overnight. It had a beginning, but then its fulfillment waited, awaited 400 years. Okay, but then Second Samuel 7.14, right? You have the Davidic covenant. There's a beginning and an end date when it talks about how David's son, it talks about him. And I know it's used to in reference to the Messiah in the future. Someone will rule on the throne of David. Sure. Yes, but, but it's Solomon in this historical context, right? It's what? It's Solomon, 2 Samuel 7, 14. Bingo. That's what I'm trying to hit. So is it, it has a clear start and end date, like a range is clear, you know, like in mathematics. Yeah. You have a Not beginning. Really, because in that prophecy says his throne will be forever if he obeys me. It's conditional, right? If you go to 2 Samuel 7, 14, and you cross-reference cross it with 1 Chronicles 17, because this promise is repeated also in 1 Chronicles 17, 10 to 14, 1 Chronicles 22, 7 to 10, and 1 Chronicles 28, 3 to 7, same promise, but there's a condition. This man, if he obeys me, his throne will be forever. Well, okay, he failed and he died. But the promise to David must be fulfilled because God swore in Psalm 89, this covenant I'm making with you where my throne will remain with you is irrevocable. I will never revoke it. You'll never fail to have a man sitting on your throne. So if one of your sons fails to be faithful, I will punish him, but I won't remove the throne from you. So now if God cannot lie and God keeps his promise to David, where is the fulfillment of the prophet promise and who's going to sit on his throne forever? Well, I know it's supposed to be Jesus, but you have two different genealogies that are different. Okay, now you change the subject, though. We'll get to the genealogies, and I'll get there. But first of all, the first point, if God cannot lie, how does Islam come and fulfill that covenant? Because you're saying David is a Muslim. So how does Islam fulfill that covenant? Well, because I was saying he was worshiping just one God, Ahad, right? How and is that the covenant? The covenant of David is, my throne will remain with you forever and ever. I have not lied to David. I have sworn and will not go back on my oath that David will not fail to have a man sitting on the throne. That's Psalm 89. So because, how does Islam fulfill that? Because Jesus was telling people about the stumbling block that will come in the future. And the stumbling block would be the tribes, you know, that come out of Arabia. You're, right. You're saying Matthew 21 and that same parable where Jesus says he's the son whom the tenants will murder. And that means it's pointing to Muhammad who denies that he's the son. No, I mean, like, it's, it's just saying that, like, the people, the, the, the Jewish people were basically forsaking. Yahweh, you go to Matthew but, 20, that's where the stumbling block is. Okay, let me Matthew go there. 21, 33 to 44, 
Why do you ignore that? He then gives a parable that the servants are prophets whom they kill. And then God sends last of all his son, whom he loves, which you don't believe and Muhammad doesn't believe. So how's that pointing to Muhammad? Okay, let me look at that. Yeah. Read it's Matthew 21, 33, 40. That's it. And if you want the specific part, read 37 of 44. That's a stumbling block. They respect my son, right. But when the vine growers saw this son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. They took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the own well, to me, that can just fulfill the Almadia passage. It's not necessarily yeah. on the cross. Like, you know, you're talking about Almadia 5, but, 17. But the Quran says he's not the son and he's not the heir. Right. But Jesus says he is the son and he is the heir. And they killed him to get the inheritance. So now God will come and destroy the temple and the city. So whatever nation will be given the kingdom, it's not Islam. Because if you continue reading the New Testament, that nation consists of the Gentiles being engrafted into the body of Christ being the church. Well, but how can the Gentiles not be the Arabs? Any Arab that believes in Jesus. Right, that's what I'm saying. And like, you know, when Jesus says, for example, in John 15, 5, uh, 15, he says, this is how you abide in my love. You keep my commandments. And that's so, the same John that has Jesus claiming to be one with the Father who gives everlasting life, who will raise the dead at the last day, none of which Muhammad believed. Right, I, know, I know your point because you would just accuse me of just picking the scriptures where I want to pick it. You that's know? What you so let's go with that, John. That same John 15 where he says the father, it's his father. He is the son and he's the one who sends the Holy Spirit from the father, none of which Muhammad believes. So why are you a Muslim then if you believe these passages? See what you're saying. Yeah. John 15, if you read all the way, read all the way to verse 10. Man, I am the true father, you are the branches, right? Yeah, I gotta, I gotta spin this page back a little bit. This is an old yeah. Bible, man. That's okay. And then he says, "I'm the true vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, shall bear much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. But right. if you don't bear fruit, you'll be pruned, you'll be cut off, and burned up. But then, why don't you read nine and ten? Okay, I see that. Just as think right here on this page. That's all right. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love." And it goes right to why I was quoting. If you keep my commandments, okay, you but abide my you love. don't believe God is the father of anyone. How does this point to Islam again? Right. Well, when John's like the last gospel, so that would be like development. But you just yeah. quoted John. See what you just I did? I know. I quoted you or you did. You're right. You know what I mean? Because if I'm going to stick with one verse, I got to accept it all. That's what you're basically yeah. saying. Now read 26. I John respect 15. that. I respect that. Yeah. Yeah, you read. can't quote a, a book against me, and then when that book refutes you, oh, well, it's later development. So then that means don't quote the book. But yeah, you're the I, one just, who advised, I just put it in gameplay. I just put it in gameplay. I see your point. Yeah. And you're right. the one who advised us to go to the red letter edition. You didn't qualify. Don't go to John. In fact, you even quoted John in that discussion, didn't you? Right, I did. Okay, so when I'm quoting John, now it's development. But first you're telling me go to the red letter edition. I'm going to the red letter edition, and Jesus doesn't sound like he's a Muslim. Read John 15, 26. Okay, 15, 26. Yeah. Man, i got to find this here. 15, okay, here it is. When the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will also testify about me. So Jesus will send the comforter from the Father. So no, again, God is the Father, and Jesus sends the comforter. Yeah, so says, none I, of which, yeah, I will send. None of which Islam believes. Islam does not believe God is the Father, let alone the Father of Jesus. And if you say, like some Muslims, I'm not you, that this is the comforter, you just prove Jesus is Muhammad's God because Jesus sends the comforter. But if Muhammad is the comforter and Allah sent him, but Jesus sends the comforter, that means Jesus is the God who sent Muhammad. So aren't you worshiping Jesus as your Allah? <laughs> Very slick. So if I do what you tell me to do, I could never follow Muhammad. I, 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 I have a better chance of following Joseph Smith than Muhammad. So why did you choose Muhammad when he clearly contradicts Old and New Testaments? Okay, see what you're saying. If you want me to show you where Jesus claims to be God from the red letter edition, uh, that's very easy. For example, chapter 57 of the Quran, it says, He is the first and the last. Allah is the first and the last, right? That's right. 57 verse 3. Right. All right, well, I, I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to tell me when Allah died, all right? Because in Islam, only Allah is the first and the last, correct? Right. Now, if you want to read it, you can go to Revelation 117. Do you want to look right, at it? Right. It says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. He says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he placed his right hand upon me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Well, according to Quran, that's Allah. 
I'm the living one. I was dead, and behold, I live forevermore. So why is Jesus claiming to be God Almighty? Well, this is my issue. Okay, you go to the Hebrew, Genesis 1, 1. Bereshit, yes. Elohim, yes. Aleph, Tav, untranslated Aleph, Tav. Yes. And so that shows Elohim is yes. the Aleph, Tav, not Jesus. Well, hold on. How can it not be Jesus when Jesus comes and says, I am the Alpha and Omega? Well, anyone can I say that the Alpha and Omega. I meet homeless people who say that. Okay, but Jesus left the tomb empty and you believe he's in heaven alive. Can you point to a homeless pe person saying it and then coming back to life, never dying again? <laughs> I like you. <laughs> okay, so now we'll, we'll go with Genesis 1 1. Why did you assume that Elohim does not include the Son? I know, and I, I see what you're saying because Elohim, a lot of Christians will say that Elohim is like, it is plural, M, but it's a royal plural. Well, you can know? you prove, can you attest that? Can you show from the Hebrew itself where there was. The plural of majesty. I hear that often asserted, but never proven. What's your proof? I, that's just the tradition of the Hebrew language. I heard it my whole life. Prove it, because that tradition is a medieval tradition that arose later. There is no evidence before, during the time of Christ, that such linguistic feature was in usage. You got to prove. You can't just make an assertion. Okay, so you're saying that the, the royal plural was a medieval invention, basically. Yeah. Kind of like the it dotting came later, after the fact, in order to respond. Two, because Christians and Jews have been debating. In fact, I want to even challenge you even to do something better. Prove to me the use of the royal plural in Arabic at the time of Muhammad. Because that's what the Muslims tell you. When Allah says we, that's a plural majesty. Right. I'm going to challenge you. You can't give a single historical, textual, archaeological evidence for that assertion. That's an assertion. There is no evidence for that. Well, I'm not a native Arabic speaker like you, man. No, no, I'm not saying. Forget me. I'm a Syrian, actually. I'm a Syrian. I'm older than the Arabs. But... When I say older, you know, ask, ask them, ask the scholars that are trying to convert you to their branch of Islam, whether it's Salafism, whatever. Say, can you give me any historical, textual, archaeological proof that the Arabic had the royal plural at that time? They can't give you any. There's none. But don't take my word for it. I'm telling you, go to the mosque that you go to, the masjid. Say, can you show me linguistically, archaeologically, textually, the use of royal majesty was something that the arabs employed you won't find it well my, my thing with that argument though is like i see your point i i really do but like a lot of times language is really of the poor you know what i mean it's not the, the elite that make it so it's not like you're always going to have this line of transmission like i can take the word god is good right but like if you look at like really old english the original word for good was actually god so when you say something is good in English, you're actually yeah. saying it's a God. That's it's You're actually making my case because you're saying language evolves, so something can have a different manner and later. That's why I'm saying go back to the time of Muhammad to prove the plural majesty. You just made my point. So I would to have to go back to literature from the 500s, 600s. You, you got to find it, yeah. I mean, obviously the Quran was given, situated in a historical context, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so that argument made my point. You can't tell me because later civilizations – employ the royal, royal uh, majesty or you know plural of majesty royal plural that that means they were using a time muhammad so your argument actually confirmed what i'm saying <laughs> right i see what you're saying so, so i would have to go and find the evidence history. myself you see if the royal plural history. existed in the arabic yeah now since we're on the gospels red letter edition unless you have a question i want you to try to reconcile for me red letter words of jesus when Jesus makes claims that even the Quran claims only Allah can make. For example, in John 5, 21, Jesus says, Just as the Father gives life and raises the dead, so too the Son shall give life to whom he is pleased. I want you to look at it so you don't think I'm making it up. John 5, 21. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. And then in verse 25, which is a very powerful statement, it says, he goes, truly, I say to you, the hour is coming and it is now come where the dead will hear the voice of the son of God. And those who hear will live, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So Jesus said, whose voice are they going to hear? The son of God's, his. But then in 28, 29, he says, the hour is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. So you see Jesus saying the last day, Yom Al-Qiyamah. He will resurrect the dead physically out of their graves, both the righteous and the wicked, by his voice. Okay. I, I right? can see that. But I have a question that in verse 29. Yes. And will come forth those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection 
of judgment. So how's that atonement if it's based on your judgment, if it's based on your deeds? Uh, that's very easy. Why not? We'll, I'll, I'll answer that now, but I want to come to the point. But very easy. Who do you think makes your deeds effic efficacious and acceptable to God, thereby meriting a reward? Well, God has to consider it, give you the grace and mercy, you know? Bismillah, here on your name. No, the blood of Jesus. You Don't read Islam. You're going to the Bible. Can you show me Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim in the Bible? You, well, you Again, well, because you weren't catechized, you do not understand. If it's not the blood of Christ, none of your righteous deeds would merit anything. Because as Isaiah said, your righteous deeds are like filthy rags. So well, who do you think? Like where I'm kind of confused on this, though, in all sincerity, is like this. Like 130 times Jesus says, like in the four Gospels, literally 130 times in English Standard Version. I think it's like 131 times in the ESV. He talks about repent for the kingdom of God is near. Sure. See, this again tells me why you should not have been a campus pastor. Who told you that the gospel of Christ excludes repentance and faithfulness? Well, that's my point. So why is Jesus focused more on repentance than his own crucifixion in the gospels, but then the crucifixion well, becomes wait, a bigger deal of all? You're saying that he has to say it a number of times for it to be true, so the times he says it, let's ignore it? Well, no, but it does show an emphasis. Yeah, the emphasis is turn from your evil lifestyle, turn to me, and because of my atonement, I will make your works efficacious. That's the gospel, which you were not taught. See, I, I feel like part of me is kind of reacting because a lot of the Christianity in this country is just pure, pure junk. You know what I mean? Like I they, they, they say things like, oh, I believe in Jesus. Like kids believe in Santa Claus, right? But they actually like behave a good way for a month so they can get their gifts from Santa. But that word for faith, that's the implication. It means when you believe, you should actually obey it. So I'm yes. around these, like these wimpy, feminized men, you I know, agree. and it, it's just it's so crazy. And and the Muslims, dude, at least they follow Jesus. They you may not think they're theologically right. They follow okay? Jesus, but but they they acknowledge Jesus. They follow Jesus, man. Oh, Jesus, Paul, Paul, whom you don't like, whom you claim didn't follow Jesus. Well, I don't know Paul personally. He could be a nice guy for all I know. No, well, no. Let's go with that historically. Paul right. met the apostles. Muhammad didn't. Paul had the right hand of fellowship with the apostles. Muhammad didn't. When he says people are going to preach another Jesus, present a different spirit and a different gospel, and if someone preaches a gospel other than we have preached, even if it's an angel, may God condemn him. And lo and behold, 600 years later comes this man preaching another Jesus, presenting a different gospel and a different spirit, and claims an angel came to him. And you're going to trust him over against Paul, who was at least there, who was an eyewitness to the disciples of Christ, who was given the right hand of fellowship. Are you really making sense here? I see what you're saying. Can I ask you something about Paul, though? Sure, go ahead. First Corinthians 15, the resurrection yep. chapter. Let me go there. Yep, go ahead. Man, I just lost my page there. That's all right. Okay. My page of John just flew on my Bible. This is an old Bible. That's all right. So, That's good. That means hopefully, because those words on your heart will bring you back to the Jesus that I want you to come to know truly. Go ahead. All right. So I'm sure you know this. You're an apologist. You should know this. You know how Paul, you know how we copy and paste people's information today? Yes. Well, Paul did that. We know for a fact Paul did not write First Corinthians. Well, they say the scholars say I don't want to say, okay. but the scholars yeah. say that you know Paul did not write this. But how can Paul not write a poem? Like the argument goes yeah. like this: For mm -hmm. I, del I deliver you your argument, for I delivered to you as a first importance what I also received. So mm -hmm. Paul saying I received this information from somewhere else, and he says now he's quoting this poem that mm -hmm. scholars say he did not write. So, so then why would he need to write it? Well, well, how can Paul not? I mean, how do you know Paul didn't? How do you know? Well, I, I'm, I'm, going your argument. Argument. I'm going by Friend, I didn't make a comment. I'm going by your argument. Let's assume he didn't write it. So what? So then, like, how do you know it's reliable, you know? Because if you continued reading and didn't stop, you'll see that he mentions the living eyewitnesses, Peter and James, who are still alive, and more than 500 people, most of them still alive, that could confirm what he's saying is true. Do you have anything similar for Muhammad? Well, yeah, I know. I know the hadiths were written like two hundred years later, man. Oh, but do you have anything similar? Did Muhammad can Muhammad appeal to the eyewitnesses of Jesus to back him up? No, because you just quoted First Corinthians, but you didn't read five and six, nor did you read seven, where he says he appeared to Cephas, he appeared to more more than five hundred of the brethren, most of them still alive. How could he get away with that if he's lying? If they were not alive? All right, let, let me ask you this, Gary Habermas, man. He says this verse right here. One of his arguments on this passage. Dr. Gary Habermas was saying that this originates in Judea. Exactly. So th this letter, 1 Corinthians, of course, is written to a Greek city, Corinth. So yes. one of Gary Habermas' argument on the resurrection is that the preaching started in Jerusalem, and that's important, you know, for the resurrection because you can check the lie based on the location. 
But when you're writing to a Corinthian city, those people can't just walk to Jerusalem in that time period and see James and Cephas. So you mean the same Paul who says they already met Cephas in 1 Corinthians 1, 10 to 17? They already well, how, knew do you know, how do you know he's not making it up? Because he says, so I become all these him. people. Okay, so hold on. So he's writing to a people who claim to follow Cephas, and he's lying, and he's telling the people you follow Cephas, but he's lying because they didn't, and he still got away with it. Can you give me any evidence that shows that then he was condemned for lying? Because you're making an assertion. I'm going by the letter you quoted to me. The right. same letter says in 1 Corinthians 1, there were people there at Corinth who knew Cephas and claimed to follow him. If he's lying, how does he get away with it? Because they'll say, hey, man, wait, you're telling us we know Cephas, you're lying, buddy. And they don't need to go and find out the individuals that night. They still have enough time, because it's running around 55 AD, even according to Bart Ehrman, to then make that necessary travel to say, hey, we got this guy Paul at Corinth saying that you, Peter, and we have found out that you're here in Jerusalem, that that supposedly you saw Jesus was alive. Oh, no? he's So can you give me anything comparable to, to Muhammad? Okay. I see oh, your no. point. Okay, because like what I'm thinking here is the, the apostles. I don't think the other apostles really like Peter. I mean, my bad, erase that. I'm sorry, I misspoke. I don't think like Peter really liked Paul. I don't think they're best of buddies. I know that. Well, because like you see like Paul mouthing them off like in Galatians. You know, Paul's trying. He says to the, the other apostles he wishes they castrate themselves outright. No, he well, wasn't saying to the other apostles. He's not about Judaizers who are perverting the gospel. He didn't say it was Peter, James, or John. You're reading too much into that. But where did you find that Paul was uh, castigating Peter? Well, because he says I confront him to his face. I mean, they don't yeah. really seem like they're friends. And this book of Acts is all about Paul. Right, you proved my point. You again do what Muslims do. You quote Galatians 2, 11 to 16. Why did you ignore verses 1 to 10? The same Paul that you're selectively citing said that 14 years later, he went up to Jerusalem, met with Peter, James, and John, the pillars. Right, story and he story. The right hand of fellowship. So that part you don't trust, but you do trust the part where he's castigating Peter. You know, you, you just proved my point, because if he obviously castigated Peter to his face, and I acknowledge that, then obviously he met with them. Historio is the Greek word. He history, got the history from Peter. What did Peter do when he came and said, hey, is the gospel I'm preaching, is it the same gospel you, you preach? Did he say no, or he said yes? Well, according to, to Paul, Peter agreed with it. But the only source you have is Paul. Now you're using Paul to condemn Paul, but when Paul refutes you, then he's not reliable. So yeah, I, I, yeah I can't. It's a double standard. You're right. You know. Okay, so can you, you see why you're being inconsistent here? I do. You can't quote Paul to condemn Paul when then Paul refutes you and say, well, I don't trust him. Well, how do you trust him for anything he says? That's Islamic way of convincing people to follow Islam. Because if you just go with facts and context, you'll never be a Muslim. Okay, I see what you're saying. You'll never be a Muslim. But again, let's come back. At least Paul is there, even a Bart Ehrman who's an atheist, who's not a Christian, will tell you Paul didn't invent this. And Paul did meet with the eyewitnesses, and he saw what he called a bereavement vision, because this is Bart Ehrman, just on historical grounds. He says, historically, we can demonstrate at least Peter and Mary Magdalene had a vision, which he calls a bereavement vision, that convinced them God raised Jesus physically, and he's alive in heaven, reigning as God. And Paul had the same vision. And if Paul didn't make it up, he inherited it from them and met them. And they were in agreement. This is a Bart Ehrman. If an enemy of the faith agrees to the facts of my position, case is closed. Muhammad gets thrown out of the court. So why are you a Muslim? All right, I see your point. And then, I haven't even gone into the moral issues of Paul and Muhammad. Because if we talk about the morality, Muhammad right. will not hold a candlestick next to Paul. I'm kind of losing you, sir. I'm sorry. Well, that's your connection. My connection is good. Can you hear me now? I'm sorry, what? Yeah, I so said that's your connection. And We haven't even gotten into the morality. Can you hear me? No, it's going, going in and out. I don't know if you hear me. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you, but you can't hear me. But it's, yeah, it's, it's a going in and out. It's like uh, 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 when you're talking, you know? Yeah, that's, can you let me know in the connection. Now it's, I can good. Hear now it's good. Now it's good. Okay. okay. Let alone, I said, we haven't even gotten into the morality where I'll show you Muhammad cannot even compare to Ma Paul when it comes to morality. So you gave up Paul because you thought he hijacked Christianity for a man who comes supposedly 600 years later, who never met any of the eyewitnesses. And yet Paul did meet the eyewitnesses. And then when we compare Paul's moral ethical code, it makes Muhammad look more evil than Hitler. And yet you left Paul for Muhammad. Well, people would say to me like, well, you know, like Muhammad, he, he, you know, he, he's some black. You're breaking up. What? Yeah, poor guy's breaking up. Pray, guys, in Jesus' name, the connection stays strong. Hold on. 
Uh oh, hold on. I think something happened. Hold on, guys. Can you hear me, brother? And humanity? Hold on. I don't know what's going on. Hold on, guys. Let me go here. One second. I don't want to lose this guy. One second. Oh, but it's not going to work. Can you hear me now? I hope we don't lose this guy. Hold on, man. Yeah, I don't know. Please follow me. Name. Sorry, guys. That's as good as it gets. All right. Can you guys hear me? Hopefully you can. We lost this guy. All right, we lost this guy. Maybe he'll come back. Hope he calls back. All right. What can I do, guys? Please, my God. Father, Son, Spirit, and Jesus, Mother, and What's wrong with the connect? Hopefully he'll come back. I don't know what to tell you. All right. All righty then. How's my sound? Is it good? Is my sound good? Because I want him to come back. I want to finish the conversation. All right. My, my, my screen is not that good. It's buffering. But what can I do? As long as the sound is good, maybe let him call back. Hey, Brad, call back, buddy, if you can. Call back if you can. I'm here by the modem. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. I hope it gets better. Please, Lord. Oh, yeah. Please, Father, Son, and Spirit. Jesus, Almighty name. In Jesus, Almighty name. In Jesus, Almighty name. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. Yeah. Man, dude. What are you going to do? All right. Father, Son, and Spirit. In Jesus, Almighty name. Son, and Spirit. Almighty name. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. Almighty name. Lord, to the Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus, Almighty name, in Jesus, Almighty name, in Jesus, Almighty name, Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus, Almighty name, Father, Son, and Spirit. Brad, if you're hearing, come back. Guys, what a blessing and a great opportunity. That's the man that was interviewed by Eddie of the Dean Show. The man is still open. Pray God will do a miracle and rock him to bring him to the feet of Jesus Christ. Because after this session, there's no way... He can remain a Muslim with a clear conscience because his conscience will eat him up by the power of the Holy Spirit. What's up, Brad? You got good connection now, Brad? Connection's bad, sir. I mean, Jesus, our Lord, the Almighty Son of God, open yeah, the connection. Yeah, but it was my battery. It just, it was, it's not... Okay, go ahead, brother. We were talking. We left off and you are cutting out. May the Lord Jesus open that internet connection. Please, Lord, rebuke Satan. Right, can you hear me? Okay, sir. Us. I can hear you now. Keep praying for this guy. He's under warfare, guys, as you can see. Listen, you won. I'm going to give that to you, okay? And listen, I challenge any Muslim that wants to criticize me to go debate Sam. If you got guts like I do, you're going to – yeah, it's exactly. But it's to debate. And, and or question – I wasn't really debating you, but I was questioning. But at least I had the yeah. courage to show my face. Good and man. so anyone who wants to criticize me in the future, do the same. That's all I'm saying. Sam, I, I want to I wanna keep in touch. Please. Um, I said you your name. I said um, – I wrote to you actually on your Skype. Yeah, good. I'm going to keep in contact because I want to talk to you because you're on a journey. Your journey hasn't ended. So we'll talk. But like I tell you, if you tell people like Eddie that you're talking to me, they're going to be afraid and upset. You know, I can do what I want. I'm my own man. No, no, it's okay. I'm just I already, email, I already sent you a message on Skype. All right. I will look for you on Skype. But we're going to stay in contact. But I don't care what I people say because I, I am my own man. Good. Yeah, and you're a good man. Jesus. And then maybe in the future we're going to talk about why Paul is superior to Muhammad. Poor guy lost his connection. All right. Okay. Guys, I do have a praise report. I can't share everything. A lot of private information, so I'm not going to share everything. But you guys, were you listening to the previous session? Were you guys listening to the previous session? We had a gentleman who called in who was a campus pastor, a campus pastor who then became a Muslim and he was featured by Eddie of the Dean Show. And he came and we had an amazing session and I can now confirm and verify and if God wills, he'll be going public and he allowed me to share this with you, only these details, okay? Because there's stuff he cannot share and it's private, it's between him and the Lord and me, he trusts me with it. He now worships Jesus Christ as his Lord, God, and Savior. He's repentant. So the man that we spoke to earlier, who became a Muslim, is now back by the power of the Holy Spirit, 
the Holy Spirit convicted him. He awoke. He came to his senses. And he confessed. And he's going to come out publicly in due course. He's going to have to do it publicly. Because publicly, he on public, saying he's a Muslim. So he's going to have to publicly confess Jesus Christ in due course. But he gave me permission. He told me, yes, Jesus is my Lord, my God, and Savior. So he's repented. He realized he made a mistake. And now he's worshiping Jesus Christ as his Lord, God, and Savior. Right? So bear with me. It's going to buffer as long as the audio is good. This is the best I can do. I don't have millions of dollars. I don't have a professional studio. All right? So he's back worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. And as God heals him, restores him, he's going to go back preaching the gospel and saving souls by the power of the Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, let me share with you one part of the story that's miraculous, unbeknownst to me. You guys are ready? One part of the story that's miraculous. And Lord willing, he's going to come out publicly. But here's the miracle. I didn't know that. He shared it with me. And he's listening right now, by the way. He's listening. He told me that when Eddie of the Dean Show uploaded that clip of him, he goes, that was in September. But for some reason, Eddie uploaded that clip. He actually prayed. He actually prayed. You listening, guys? He actually prayed. Listen to the story. He asked God to have one of the Christian apologists, meaning us online, because he knows about us. He knows about Jay Smith. He knows Al Fadi, David Wood, and me. He prayed. He goes, God, have one of the Christian apologists find this clip and respond to it. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? He prayed specifically that God would have one of us, Christian apologists, Find the clip and respond to it. And he said he was looking on YouTube to see if anyone responded. And he found my response. Are you blown away or what? Are you blown away? Because he blew me away. Why did he blow me away? The Lord is listening. I do not watch Eddie anymore. And the last time I responded to Eddie at the Dean Show, maybe over a year ago. If you go back, I haven't done anything about Eddie. Maybe it's been almost two years. And I promise you. I was on YouTube. You know how YouTube shows you clips and recommends? I saw the clip. It was short. I go, let me listen to it. Tell me your God isn't the most real being, that he is reality, that he's alive, and he's in love with us, and he's doing all by his spirit to bring you to him. How do I know this man prayed to God, asking God to have one of us, Christian apology. He said, one of these Christian apologists. Find the clip and respond to it. And I'm looking on YouTube. I see the clip. And I said, let me watch five minutes. And then it put a fire in my heart to respond to it. And I respond to it in answer to his prayer. As Jesus is signed to him, look, I am real. I am God. I am the son of God. I am one with the spirit. I am your Lord. And I'm going to bring you back because you're the prodigal son. He told me that today. He's listening. So those are the only things I can share. Everything else is private between him and me and the Holy Spirit of God. But he will come out publicly and he will publicly repent because he went public with his confession as a Muslim. Boy, is Eddie going to be upset. Boy, is Eddie going to be upset. Brethren, rejoice with me because that's a sign that our God lives He's almighty, and he's the God of the Bible, and he's the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, who became flesh and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is your Lord and Savior, and Jesus is in love with you, and he's watching you, and he'll never leave you. It's also a sign that when you cry out to the Lord, he will bring you to him, and it's a sign we are of the Lord, because why would the Lord bring him to me and use me to answer his prayer if God is not using me in spite of my imperfections and my weaknesses and sins? So this blesses me. This encourages me because then Jesus is telling me, Sam, you're mine. You're in my hand. Oh, about to make myself cry. <clears throat> you're mine. You belong to me. You're in my hand. I'm in love with you. In spite of your perfections and sins and struggles, you are mine. I'm not done with you and I will not abandon you. I'm in love with you, Sam. And I'm in love with you, Jesus. <laughs> I'm in love with you. Right? Anyway, so there you go. Our our Lord lives. Rejoice, brethren.
The prodigal son came home. And I want to say to him, Brad, we love you. His name is Brad. Pray for him. Jesus is reality. He is alive. He is the truth. He's in love with you. And he'll never leave nor forsake you. And he proved it to you. And he proved